Fever, 1793, Chapter 8. September 2nd, 1793. I smelled the breath of death for the first time since all this hardship began. I was scared. Diary of J. Henry C. Helmuth, Philadelphia, 1793. From the time the Colette Ogilvy collapsed, the church bells of Philadelphia tolled without cease. Guns were fired on the street corners and a cannon blasted in the public square to purify the air. On top of that, we suffered the constant buzz of mosquitoes, blowflies, and hornets. The din was maddening. The day after our ill-fated tea party, Mother sent a note to the Ogilvies inquiring about Colette's health, but received no response. They disappeared. She also sent a note to the Ludingtons. No word from them either, thank heavens. Many of the wealthy families were fleeting, or fleeing. We were lucky to get four or five customers a day. Mother worried even more than usual, but I was too hot to care. A violent thunderstorm on Sunday cleared the air for a few hours, but when the sun came out on Monday, it baked the streets until the rainwater rose in ghostly plumes of steam. It, I felt like a noodle overboiled in the stew pot, and the bells continued to toll. I'm going to climb the church tower and cut the tongues out of those bells myself, Eliza grumbled as she beat a dozen eggs. Hand me the nutmeg, child. I passed her the small grater. Don't you have something to do, she asked. It's hot enough in here without an extra body breathing on me. What did your mother say before she left? I'm waiting for Grandfather to finish his business in the necessary. He said I could go with him to the newspaper office. Eliza scowled and waved a towel at the flies buzzing above the bowl. Pick me some fresh asparagus grass. These pests are a plague. The bright sun blinded me as I stepped outdoors. The garden looked stressingly poor. Even with all the watering I had done and the brief rain, it was a good thing we were able to buy at the market. The asparagus grass grew along the back fence. I gathered a handful of fronds, cut them at the base, and tied a bunch nicely with a piece of twine. Back in the kitchen, I stood on a chair and hung them from an iron hook in the center ceiling beam. There, I said, pushing the chair back against the wall. That should discourage the flies. Thank you. Taste this pudding and tell me if it's right. I chewed and pondered. It needs more sugar. You think everything needs more sugar, Eliza. Wipe the sweat off her face with a handkerchief. I think that tea the Ogilvy sisters affected you. Maybe we, you would be right for their Edward. She stirred the fire and lay on one on more wood. Wasn't that long ago that folks didn't have any sugar? No coffee or tea either. Please, Eliza, not another history lesson. I'll scream. Eliza harumphed and set the pudding over the fire. Don't know which is worse, you moaning or your mother staring out the window, hoping someone will walk in and lay a shilling on the table. We have ugly days ahead of us. No sugar for anyone, rich or poor. No, no. I fanned myself with the wooden spoon. Grandfather says this trouble will be over soon. He says people don't have gumption anymore. Eliza mumbled something under her breath that, breath that I couldn't quite hear. When it came to strong-headed opinions, Eliza, my mother, and my grandfather were evenly matched. She untied her apron and hung it from the hook. Where are you going, I asked. Grandfather and I could run any errand you need. Not this errand you couldn't. Eliza reached for her pretty straw hat. The Free African Society is having a meeting about the fever. It should prove a li lively gathering. I'll return in time for supper. Out the back, the door of the necessary slammed. Maddie Cook, called Grandfather. Must I wait all day? Andrew Brown's print shop smelled of ink and grease and the sweat of muscular apprentices carrying strays, or trays of lead type from the composing table to the printing press. When I was a child, Mr. Brown let me pick out letters and set them in form. It had been a thrill seeing my words in print. The printer issued no invitation to me that morning. He was deep in conversation with Mr. Karras as we entered. What news, William? Mr. Brown asked. Packed your bags for a trip to the country? He wiped his hands on his apron and sent an apprentice for a bucket of ale. Grandfather banged his cane on the floor. I didn't run from the redcoats, and I won't run from a dockside miasma. What's wrong with people, Andrew? We suffered all kinds of disease in our youth, but folks were sensible. They didn't squall like children and hide in the woods. Mr. Karras cleaned his throat, cleared his throat. If the yellow fever were a soldier, you'd run it through with your famous sword and sit down to a hearty dinner. But there may be a cause for caution, old friend. Listen to the mayor's orders, which Andrew has just printed. He picked up a broadsheet and read, On advice from the College of Physicians. Number one, 
All persons should avoid those that are infected. 2. The homes of the sick should be marked. 3. Sick people should be placed in the center of large, airy rooms without curtains and should be kept clean. 4. We must supply a hospital for the poor. 5. All bell toys should cease immediately. 6. The dead should be buried privately. 7. The streets and wharves must be kept clean. 8. All persons should avoid the fatigue of the body and mind. 9. All persons should avoid being in the sun, drafts, and evening air. 10. All persons should dress appropriately for the weather. 11. All persons should consume alcohol in moderation. I'm glad they'll stop ringing the bells, I said. Sensible advice, most of it, Grandfather said. Still, I don't understand why so many run scared. They've taken over Ricketts Circus Building on 12th Street to house the poor, said Mr. Brown. Isn't that why we have an almshouse? asked Grandfather. The almshouse is closed. They want to protect our residents from the disease. So the fever victims lie on the floor of Ricketts with little water and no care. Once a day, they remove the bodies for burial. A neighbor threatened to burn the place down if the sick are not removed, explained Mr. Karras. But where will they go? asked Grandfather. No one knows. I hadn't heard about that. They were burying fever victims every day. How many have died, Mr. Karras? I asked. He turned to Mr. Brown. How many dead, Andrew? Mr. Brown shrugged. It's hard to say with certainty. I've heard several hundred at least, said Mr. Karras. Grandfather paused. Even a few hundred isn't enough to call it an epidemic, he said. Some doctors warn we may see a thousand dead before it's over. There are 40,000 people living in Philadelphia, William. Can you imagine if one in 40 were to die? The room quieted as we all pondered the number. I don't believe it, said Grandfather finally. People exaggerate. What news from our friend Mr. Evans? Mr. Brown looked up. His wife is ill, and he's closed his shop. My business dwindles daily. I've lo already lost one of my lads found with his family up to Wilmington. Mrs. Ogilvy said that everyone of fashion has fled to their country estates, I offered. I heard one of her daughters was stricken, said Mr. Brown. Myself, I straddle a fence. One foot stays here in Philadelphia. The other foot is in the country. We know the air there is pure and people safer. I say safer, mind, not safe. There are reports of fever in Bucks County and Delaware. What of the government, then? Grandfather asked. Jefferson still comes into town every morning, though everyone says he'll soon, soon quit and retire to his farm in Monticello, said Mr. Karras. Bah, we don't need Jefferson. We have the general. President Washington won't abandon us. Mr. Karras blew his nose loudly. The president retires to Virginia for a respite every September. He's not a man to change his habits. Even if he called the Congress back, few would dare return. I tell you, William, men who stood unafraid before British cannon run in fear from this foul pestilence. I fear for Philadelphia. I fear for the people. I fear for myself. Grandfather did not say a word as we walked home. I silently counted on my fingers 28 days until the end of September and then on into October until the first frost. Frost always killed fever. Mr. Karras said it drained the poison from the air. The Ludingtons were sounding better. Slapping pigs couldn't be that much harder than serving in the front room, and it would be better than falling ill or dying. I'd be there over harvest. They would make me work in the fields and feed me bread and water, but I wouldn't get sick. Grandfather stayed silent until we approached a limping man dressed in dark rags pushing a cart. Wonder where that fellow's going, he said. Looks like he belongs on the waterfront. A thin white arm flopped over the side of the cart as it jostled over the cobblestones. Hello there, good man, called father. There's no place for the dead up here. Hello? The man ignored us and pressed on steadily. Steadily, Perhaps he's transporting a poor woman to Ricketts Circus, like Mr. Karras said, I suggested. She should be moved at night when good people are safe in their beds. Now what is he doing? The man had stopped at the corner of High and 7th in front of our coffee house. Grandfather sped up. Sir, I protest most vehemently. I lifted my skirts and ran ahead of Grandfather. An unnamed fear shot through me. My eyes filled with tears. No, this is too much, Grandfather called angrily. Sir, he shouted, take that away from my home. Off with you now and take your cargo or I shall call the constable. The man turned back and looked at Grandfather, then lifted the handles of the wheelbarrow and dumped the woman on the street. Mother, I screamed. We're going to have to find out what happens next in Chapter 9.